Good morning. And for the Dutch people in the audience, good um, morning. I'm going to talk about smell, smelling diseases. Um, and in this case, with an electronic nose. And you might think, hmm, smelling diseases? Wow, that's new. No way. The old Greeks already did it. This is a famous painting by a Dutch painter. Uh, it's called the Euroscopist. And what they would do, have morning urine, they would look at it, they would smell it, believe it or not, they would taste it, and if it tastes a little bit sweet, uh, you probably had diabetes. So there's nothing new about smelling diseases. And also, smelling diseases can be done also by dogs. And dogs are really good at it. Why are they so good at smelling diseases? Because they have a lot of smell receptors, way more than we have. And I'm going to show you a little video about how they train dogs to smell colon cancer. To be honest, th these dogs are really, really good. There's, dogs are like humans. Some are good at it and some are not so good at it. Um, and it takes a long time to train them. And they have a certain life expectancy. But at some point, dogs die and you have to have new dogs. And actually, we have a hospital in the Netherlands where they use a dog uh, to sniff for a certain bacterial infection, for instance. So, but what do we smell? Um, Every breath we exhale, it contains a lot of nitrogen, still a lot of oxygen, water vapor, CO2, and if you smoke, there'll be carbon monoxide as well. And then there's 1% in your exhaled breath that consists of so-called volatile organic compounds. And there's thousands of them in each breath. And these volatile organic compounds reflect your metabolism. So probably, 99% of all the volatile, volatile organic compounds we exhale are similar. But if you have a certain disease, your metabolism changes, and the mix of these volatile organic compounds will be slightly different. And you saw the movie. This is what an electronic nose can smell. It can smell the difference in the composition of your volatile organic compounds if you have a disease versus if you do not have the disease. It's a fast measurement, it's relatively cheap, you don't need trained personnel, it's point of care, you have immediate results. But the thing is, we do not need to know and we also don't know what kind of volatile organic compounds we're smelling. and We don't know what we're looking for. It's a pattern, it's pattern recognition. And I'm briefly try to say how this works a little bit. Every ENOS has three sensors. And there's redox reactions of these volatile organic compounds on the surface of this sensor, which changes the conductivity of this sensor. And that basically is all the information that the ENOS has, changes in conductivity. And we use machine learning to do this pattern recognition. And so how does this work in, in general terms? Say you've never smelled coffee before and your nose picks up volatile organic compounds from the coffee. Your nose is basically where the recept receptors are. It sends a signal to your brains. Your brain stores it. And then someone tells you what you've just smelled is coffee. Oh, OK, it's coffee. Next day. You know, in a conference, there's four or five days of conference for us. And every morning, you smell the same smell. And after four or five days, you go, where's breakfast? I'll just follow my nose, and there's the coffee. 
Basically, an e-nose is the same thing. It has sensors, it sends a signal, it's stored in a database, and it identifies whether it, there's a certain disease, yes or no. Very similar. To give you a life example that you're probably all familiar with, these sniffer dogs at the airport. You know, you're there with your suitcase, and all of a sudden there's this guy with his dog, and the dog barks at your suitcase. And you go like, shit. What? Did I forget to take something out of my suitcase, or did someone put something in my suitcase? The dog doesn't really know what he's, what he's smelling. He only knows when he barks, he gets a cookie. And this is how you train dogs, but this is also how you train an electronic nose. So this dog is put in a room and has a lot of suitcases and the dog doesn't know what's supposed to happen. And at some point he just sits next to a suitcase and in the suitcase there's an illegal substance. And he gets a cookie. And I go, oh, I sit next to a suitcase, I get a cookie. I sit to the next. But there's no illegal drugs in there and he doesn't get a cookie. Goes to the next suitcase and then, oh, he gets another cookie. And after a while the dog realizes, just like the dogs in the movie, if I look for this smell, I get a reward. And this is also how we train an electronic nose. We let them smell the breath of people with a disease, and then we tell the nose, yes, this is one with a disease, and we let them smell a lot of people without the disease, and we tell the electronic nose, well, the algorithm, this is a person without the disease. So how does the process work? You have five minutes of breathing through the enos, and then through an iPad, it's sent to the cloud, it goes to the data server of the enos company, they do the analysis, and they give back the results to the iPad. But a physician wants to have these results in their EMR. And this is where InterSystems comes in. They will integrate this data from the enos company into the electronic medical records. And I'm going to give you an example. How well does this nose work? And this is research by one of my former PhD students, Sharina Kort. She's a resident of pulmonary medicine in, in my hospital. So we first did a study to see, can we actually smell lung cancer? And we did this um, with the old version of the Enos company that didn't have a CE certification yet. But we were pretty successful. It was published in lung cancer in 2018. And then we had the CE certified nose and we thought, okay, let's do it again and do one study in which we both do the training of this new model and we're going to validate it as well. And we're focusing on lung cancer. So people suspected of lung cancer, some will have it, some won't, and we also had some healthy volunteers. So this was a multi-center study, multinational. Um, so we had these patients with lung cancer and these patients suspected for lung cancer, but who didn't have it. And we used 376 of these people to train a model. And then we trained the model, the model worked really well. We fixed the model, we, based on this training set, we said, okay, we have a cutoff. If the probability based on this model is higher than 16%, we will say it's lung cancer. And then we will let that model tell us of the next 199 people, whether they have lung cancer or not, and see how well the model does. These are like the machine learning techniques we used. There's more. And then we added some really simple parameters, age, because the older you get, the more chances there are, you know, the, the higher the probability that you do have cancer, sex, and pack year smoke. Pack year smoke means, one pack year means You've smoked one pack of cigarettes per day for one year. So 60 pack years, you've smoked one pack a day for 60 years. That sounds a lot, but it's quite a lot of people who get to 60 pack years. And we added those parameters to the results of the Enos company. And as I said, the cutoff probability for having lung cancer, we put at 16%. So if your probability was over 16%, we would say, you probably have, well, you might have lung cancer. If it's below that, you probably won't have lung cancer. And why did we choose that cutoff, which is pretty low? Lung cancer is, is not a very nice disease. And if you're early in the diagnosis, you can actually treat it. So we want to have what's called a high sensitivity. And the sensitivity in this case 
was 95%. That means of all those people who eventually turn out to have lung cancer, 95% of those were identified by the ENOs. But also in healthcare, you want to rule out the disease. And that's what we do with a negative predictive value, the NPV. So that means if our test was negative, your probability was below 16%. There was a 94% certainty that you would not have lung cancer. And that's pretty good. And how does that compare for instance? Oh, and we can do that just as well for stage one and two lung cancer as for the later stages. So how does that compare for instance to CT scan? CT scan is considered, you know, the best that we have at the moment. And this is a very recent review from YAMA, leading medical journal, 2021. Sensitivity of a CT scan is 59 to 100%. I think with the 95%, we're not doing too bad. And specificity is between 26 and 100%, and we're almost in the middle. Specificity means of all the people who do not have the disease, how many people, of what percentage do you diagnose as healthy? That's about half of them. It means we do not miss many people, but we do overdiagnose people. And is that a bad thing? No, because if we wouldn't use the nose, all these people would go into the diagnostic procedures for lung cancer. And now we can say to a lot of people, you probably don't have it, and we don't have to go up, follow up these people uh, with all the invasive uh, stuff. This was published very recently, March this year, in CHEST. So now the question is, where would we use this ENOS? And there's more options to use it. But our pulmonologists in my hospital, they say, wow, this would help us really in a large group of patients that we see, and they have so-called incidental pulmonary nodules. Say you're going to uh, the hospital for something completely unrelated, and you get a CT scan or you get an X-ray from your thorax, and then you know, your physician says, okay, your heart is fine, but we do see some small nodules in your lungs. Oops. You're being referred to the pulmonologist. And then there's a protocol, and this is a worldwide protocol. They look at the CT scan at baseline when you were diagnosed, well, diagnosed, you had some small nodules. Then you come back after three months, they do another CT scan, six, 12, 18, 24 months. And after 24 months, if nothing has changed on your CT scan, you're discharged. But every time you're coming back to the hospital, you don't feel really happy because, ooh, what will the CT scan say? Now, say we would combine that with an ENOS. At baseline, the CT scan says we have these nodules, and your nose says, now, the probability of lung cancer is very low. After three months, nothing has changed on your CT scan. The nodules haven't grown. Your nose again says no. Six months, again, nothing has changed on your CT scan. Your ENO still says no lung cancer. Our pulmonologists are really thinking, why would I keep this patient under, you know, in, in my care for another you know, year and a half. And this would lead to a lot of cost saving, but also patients wouldn't be so worried every time they come to the hospital. And also, for instance, if a chest physician is in doubt, oh, would this be lung cancer? We can do a biopsy, which is very unpleasant and has risks. But they would say, well, if the nose also says it's not lung cancer, we will postpone or perhaps not even do or consider this, uh, this bronchoscopy. And then, and this is like the future. Um, say you have an elderly gentleman who's been smoking a lot. By the time he gets uh, to the general practice with increased shortness of breath, he has developed COPD, he has heart failure, so the GP has to think, okay, what could it be? It can be an exacerbation of the COPD. It could be a decompensation of heart failure. He might have developed lung cancer. Or it could be a pulmonary embolism. 
So if you would then use the ENOS and just put in those, we haven't developed all these models yet. Lung cancer has been validated. We're working on pulmonary embolism. There's been some work done on exacerbations of CPD. We haven't started with heart failure. But say in a couple of years time, when we have these models ready, instead of like checking all the tests for a blood test, he can now check, okay, check those four with your breath test. And that would lead then to the most likely diagnosis at that point in time. If it's an exacerbation of CPD, the GP can probably do it himself. If it's a pulmonary embolism, he'll be rushed to the hospital. And these are other examples that are currently being investigated. Tuberculosis has been validated. Uh, we're working on pulmonary embolisms, colorectal cancer, Barrett's esophagus, thyroid carcinoma. Uh, I have a personal interest in multiple sclerosis. One of my friends has it. Um, and we're smelling multiple uh, sclerosis. MS is a really difficult diagnosis. It takes quite a while before you have the diagnosis ready. And then once you have diagnosed, you start treating patients. And it often takes up to like six months before you can actually assess whether they respond well to this therapy. And we're now hoping that with the ENOS, when you start therapy in MS patients, that your metabolism changes due to the drugs you're going to take, but it can change for the better or it cannot change much. And can we distinguish, perhaps even after a few weeks, whether the drug is going to be beneficial to the patient or not. And if not, then we can change quicker to other medication. Rheumatoid arthritis, we're also doing in our hospital. We can diagnose it. But also, a lot of patients with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, they have flare-ups of their disease. And now, they have to come to the hospital, the rheumatologist looks at all their small joints, whether they're inflamed or not, and based on all these joints, he decides, well, yeah, you have a flare-up and we're going to give you drugs. With this ENOS, say this ENOS is with the GP. The patient can go there, can exhale in the ENOS, and based on the results, uh, the GP already can prescribe the medication if it's real flare-up and no medication if it's not. So I think there's a lot of potential and we've heard the word disruptive uh, today a couple of times already. I think this is really disruptive technology. But physicians have to get used to it because they don't know what we're measuring. And it's, it's really weird for physicians to have a device telling them based on what we are measuring, we don't know what we're measuring, but we're pretty sure this is a diagnosis. And that's going to take some... Um, how do you say that? Uh, we have to convince, take some convincing that this technology really can work. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention.